As always, when we gather, we gather to uh, listen to a narrative about who we are and what we're called to be. And this week, the narrative is about greatness. Now, greatness is uh, kind of an inbuilt human thing we have. Uh, it's part, trying to figure out who we are as we grow up, our identity, um, what's good about us, what's not so good about us, what we're good at, what we're not so good at. So greatness tends to play a part in that. We're always trying to figure out back and forth. The, the problem in our day and age is that greatness has become totally politicized. And um, so uh, figuring out what grace, greatness means in our political process these days uh, can be messy at best. But the scripture provides us another way to look at it. Uh, first, we have Proverbs. Now, Proverbs, uh, who, um, what kind of wife are we after? A good wife, a perfect wife, a strong wife is what the Greek really says, no, Hebrew really says, a, a strong wife. Now, being white, male, straight, and raised in a patriarchal family, this is not a place I want to tread. There is, um, there are all kinds of problems here. It comes from a time that is not ours and how the wife is described. Uh, some might say she's a little, um, uh, that the expectations are pretty high for her. We don't know who laid those expectations out, but we can probably guess. Uh, some, might, some might say uh, that she is um, overcompensating whatever you want to call her. As I said, I really don't want to go there. Uh, but there is a piece which, we, which would be helpful for us to understand. Um, downstairs at 9 o'clock for the last three weeks, Renee has been leading us uh, into new ways, first of all, of, of how we interpret Scripture, but then how we deal with the story of David and Bathsheba, which we had earlier this summer. And Renee has helped us look at it through feminist theological eyes, um, womanist theological eyes. And those are very different ways of looking at Scripture because they aren't mine. It's not how I was raised. Uh, I'm learning. I'm having to learn faster and faster as these things expand. The other way we can look at this, this lesson from the Proverbs is that uh, the wife is Lady Israel, that um, God has taken Israel and called her to be the light to the world. So a lot of these descriptions here are about what is, what is expected of Israel. Another way of looking at it um, is in the same light because the, uh, the, uh, the, throughout Scripture, um, Israel, the church, are often compared uh, as brides. The prophets speak about this. Uh, Hosea's whole uh, story uh, in, the, in his prophecy, uh, Hosea takes a harlot for his wife as a, a sign, a, a prophecy of how Israel is not to be behaving because um, adultery is shorthand in, in Hebrew scripture for idolatry. And in the Old Testament, we're told that God doesn't want idols, that God is the only God. So there are all kinds of different ways of looking at, 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 at this passage, and we'll let Renee unpack it later on. <laughs> Uh, the, the second one is, is in James, and James, as we've heard for the last couple of weeks, James is really interested on what we do. Faith without works is worthless, he says a couple of weeks ago. What is us is quarreling amongst you, he says. It's because you're trying to make something of yourself. And then we come to uh, the, the gospel. Last week, Brother Stephen led us through uh, the first of the passion predictions, um, take up your cross and follow me. 
and he allowed, as how that's not an easy thing to do. It's countercultural, it's not what we're brought up to do, um, but there we are. And here, this week, we come up with the second prediction of the Passion. I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be executed, and I'm going to rise from the dead. And his disciples don't have a clue what he's talking about. And they're silent. They don't even ask him a question. So they go on to Galilee, and uh, Jesus is aware that they're having a little argument on the way. And when they get to the house, they, he says to them, what were you arguing about on the way? Knowing full what, well what they were arguing about. Well, they didn't say anything then either, because what they were arguing about on the way is who was greatest. When Jesus comes into his kingdom, so am I going to be the secretary of state, the secretary of war? What cabinet position am I going to get? And he says, you know, to be great, you have to be at the bottom. To be great, you have to be a slave. And he takes a child, and he puts him in his midst, gives him a hug, and says, unless you become like one of these little ones, you have no part in me. That's not what he says in this gospel lesson. He said that someplace else. If you take this child, it's how you become a part of me. It's how you become a part of God's life in your world. Now, we probably aren't bothered so much by this because we love our cuddly little kids, um, grandchildren especially, and um, you know, we've got helicopter parents. Who, you know, we, we kind of overindulge our kids in this, in this culture. Not so in Jesus' culture. They were really at the bottom of the heap. Uh, at best, the father understood that it was his responsibility to make sure they had food, but not much else. They had no rights whatsoever. They were, as some people call them, ankle biters. And Jesus says, this is the way through this innocent child, this person that has nothing at all to offer, which isn't true, we've learned, but given his time and space, has nothing to offer, and that's where you begin. This week, I learned a, um, a, a, not a new concept, but a new way of saying a concept that I had an idea of, called the concretization of the ideal. The concretization of the ideal, that's an L on the end, and what it means is that we have ideals about what life is supposed to be like, uh, how we're supposed to live, and somehow we have to uh, do something about that. Like James says, uh, faith without works is worthless. We have to do something about it. And uh, for example, marriage, uh, how do we concretize the ideal of marriage? Well. Harry meets Sally, and Sally and Harry fall in love together, and uh, they decide they're going to get married. And Harry gives um, Sally an engagement ring, and if they're really modern or even postmodern, uh, like Carl and his wife Alice, uh, Alice gave him an engagement ring. Next comes the planning of the wedding, and if you live through that, then you tie the knot, and again, if you're really modern, Sally doesn't promise to obey uh, <laughs> Harry. And then comes the next part, the marriage bed, the table of hospitality, children, and it goes on and on. And those of you who've been part of that know that, know that it's not an easy road. Concretizing the ideal takes many shapes and forms. Uh, last Sunday, we had a couple who were doing 60 years of this. That's a lot of concretizing, <laughs> figuring it out. <laughs> and we also know in our midst are people who didn't make it all the way and had to start over and rethink what the ideal was and how it was going to work. Now, Stephen and I have been working on um, 
a thing we're calling Worship 101 for Wednesday nights. And the, kind of the question we keep asking ourselves is, what is worship? And I think that what worship is, is the con concretization of an ideal. The ideal is what God's hope is for the world. And we come in here week by week to work that out by listening to the story of what that means and finally by going to the table. And it's hard for us to catch on to this of what it must have meant in the early church because in the early church, the, what it meant to be a child of God uh, in communion with one another, what it meant to be the church, was you gathered at a table for a meal. In the midst of it, you might break bread and share a cup. And there was nobody at that table that was better than another. There may have been wealthy people, there may have been slaves, but they were all equal at that table. That was a radical way of looking at the world. It's what Jesus means about how greatness begins from the bottom up. Now, what happened, of course, is that that started to disintegrate. The meal drifted off and you were left with a little piece of bread and a cup of wine. And Constantine comes along and co-ops the church. And so all of a sudden you have hierarchies in the church and which matched kind of Roman hierarchies. And, and you don't have room in, the, in, your, in your house anymore to have that, that supper. And so you move to the basilica, uh, the courthouse, a long, narrow building with an apse at the end, and you put an altar at the end, and everybody is looking one way, and everything kind of gets hierarchical. You don't sense the community. Fortunately, uh, those who planned this place, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, they, they left all the hierarchy in pews, um, but at least they made the communion rail round, there is no one special place at that rail. Uh, nobody gets a better spot. High, low, in between. We're all equal at that table. Which we say every Sunday, everybody's invited to that table. It's God's table, not ours. And God's way is always to love each of us as deeply, as deeply as we can possibly know. I learned another interesting thing this morning. Um, every morning I, I read the meditation from the, the uh, Center for Contemplation and Action, which many times is Richard Rohr and other times other people. And he, a couple of weeks ago, he did a, a week on uh, Eastern Christian spirituality. Last week he did Western Christian spirituality. And this week he started on Islam. And what I didn't know, and which is, which is I think, important for what I'm saying, is that Mohammed and Islam doesn't care about theology. It's just a waste of time to them for thinking all that stuff. What the Quran is, is a book of practices. It's how you do it in the world. And how we do it on, in the world is what we learn here and how we take it to the world. That's the concretization of an ideal. And so we come once again to this table, all is equals, rich, poor, whatever. There's no greatness here because we're all great because we're all loved. Amen.